I mean, the, the police brutality in Peru. Is that another area where you could maybe say that Peru is similar to Chile in terms of maybe a legacy of police brutality that you could trace back to the Fujimora era? I would say even, even before that, really. Because, mm-hmm. again, the Peruvian state, when Peru, and we'll kind of go back to the beginning, but when Peru got its independence uh, as a nation, it was really just an independence for the criollo and the you know, emerging aristocracy, then the emergent merchant class to have full and total control over the land in, in Peru before they had to adhere to some of the laws that the Bourbons were passing, the reforms they were passing that gave more rights. I mean, I would say indigenous people had more rights under the Spanish Empire than they did in just post independence Peru institutions of slavery, sharecropping, basically, were allowed to flourish. And so from Peru's inception to even to this day, with a short blimp with uh, Velasco's government, Peruvian government has been one that was owned by a white and wealthy bourgeoisie or aristocracy in the early times. And so because of that, police and, and the police in Peru have always, and the military as well, have always been just an extension of that violence. They've been the the, the armed wing of, of the state. Mm-hmm. And so they've always been violent against the people. They've always been classist. They've always been racist. Mm-hmm. They've always took the side of, of the state against their own people until Glasgow's generation. And after that, they had to have an extreme reform of the military and to make sure that popular movements like, like Velasco's would never occur again. They could never have the military betray the state. So the Peruvian police have always been very violent. And so it was no surprise to see that the first reaction to the protest was to murder and to injure. Mm. And we have a video of a police officer from this unarmed protester. And this was in November. This wasn't like years ago. This was November. An unarmed protester and another police officer in the back is heard saying, kill him, kill him, kill him. And then he's trying to shoot and he can't shoot because the, the barrel is stuck. And he's like, he says it in curses and he says, this is stuck. So the only reason that that man wasn't murdered by the police on camera right there so easily was because their, their, their weapon was stuck. Their weapon was kind of crappy. And that saved his life. And that just goes to show how violent and how, you know, ultimately how much hatred they have for the people the yeah. police officers are trained to. And of course, the police and and the military have kind of played an outsized role in Latin American politics. Just as a side note, you know, it is interesting, the example of uh, Velasco and uh, and now Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, who is uh, a military man. But it it seems that when the left has succeeded in Latin America, and I guess you could say in, in Cuba as well, it's been because this kind of kind of military, but but pride for the country, maybe a kind of a left wing nationalism that has reclaimed the state against these foreign interests, which are represented by the comprador class. So is uh, is this something that's talked about often in Peru on the left? Oh, absolutely. And to your point about nationalism, which I find funny because you have indigenous people walking, marching with the Peruvian flag in hand with the huipala. There's Mm -hmm. a great sense of love and pride for the country. In fact, we see it as like, the bourgeoisie, they're not patriotic. They're not nationalistic because you have, you have so much disdain for the nation. They don't care. They, they, they're nationalistic to their class. They're class first mm-hmm. only. And Peru is a country made up of working class people, of peasants, of black and brown and, and native people. And they're selling them out to, yes, foreign interests to also benefit themselves. And the problem is the Peruvian military right now just... In, in more ways, I'd say that they're following the, the lead, that they're following the orders. They're attacking labor strikes in Ica mm. and protesters all over the country, because all over the country was protesting. It wasn't just in Lima or in any particular city. You have people mm. from the jungle to the mountains to the north, the south, the coast. Everyone, there was a large amount of protest. And I wouldn't say that it was necessarily left wing either, even though I think the left wing is coming out much stronger in this in the end. But There is still a distrust of the Peruvian police and the military and that they're one in the same. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is if you could kind of identify a class character of these protests, it seems to me like it to some degree must vary geographically and that Mm -hmm. there are kind of different elements of these protests. How would you characterize these protests ideologically in terms of uh, what's driving people out the streets? I think in the beginning, like in early November, right after when everything was really, really hot, that 
you could see all people, all different classes, all different races, groups, regions, everyone, even political ideologies were coming out and just saying like, oh, Congress is corrupt and we're against corruption, which is why as left-wingers, left-wingers have to talk about, well, what really brews the, the co corruption in the country? It's, it's one, it's the constitution, it's neoliberalism that exists here. So what has sustained the sustained efforts, like the labor strikes in Ica, and the, and the movements in, in Lima and all over the country, the ones that are still going on today are one that is a populist, working class, left-wing, nationalistic, left-wing, nationalistic kind of movement. The, the youth, the LGBTQ youth and indigenous people and Afro-Peruvians in Lima are coming together, creating their own organizations, their own protests. The win that we just saw in Argentina in terms of legalizing abortion mm -hmm. has given inspiration to so many people in Peru like Rocio Santi Esteban. And so I would say that the, like the continued efforts are definitely one that is more left-wing than ever than the others to say, especially that of the movement of a new constitution, have a constitutional assembly, because well, the right-wingers aren't going to call for a constitutional assembly. The, the constitution supports everything that they stand for. Yeah. So it's the left-wingers that are saying, we need to change the constitution. And I think, unfortunately, Juntos por Peru actually did change their position on this, they started out saying that they wanted a new constitution and a constitutional assembly, and now they're calling for a constitutional reform, but Patria Roja is still calling for a new constitution in the style of, of Chile. We have a popular assembly elected directly by and for the people, and mm -hmm. we create a new constitution altogether. Right. This was a major part of the uh, pink tide governments that came to power in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, these constituent assemblies which came together to write uh, better constitutions, you know, very good constitutions. And in, in the case of, well, all, all three of these examples, I think people giving a right to things like housing in Venezuela. So are people seeing this explicitly as a way to kind of bring Peru into this pink tide, into this movement of left-wing Latin American governments? Do they see oh. themselves com yeah, in, in that way compared to these other examples that have succeeded? Well, I think that people in Peru, and unfortunately, a bit of the left wants to not identify with that. Mm -hmm. It's very odd, but because there's a lot of xenophobia in Peru. Granted, mm -hmm. it was headed by the right wing to look at Venezuela and be like, oh, look at Venezuela. Look, look at those Venezuelans coming into Peru and creating violence, stealing. Mm -hmm. Like, like Peru's problems started when Venezuelans migrated in mass to Peru. And so, and then also just a lot of the propaganda against places like Venezuela and Colombia. I mean, sorry, not Colombia, Cuba. And Peruvians are like, oh, okay, we're not going to do it exactly like them. We're going to do it our mm -hmm. own way. So, because it, unfortunately, there still is a lot of anti-communism, anti-socialism, just between yeah. what they've seen in other parts of Latin America, despite not under, like not, maybe most of the people aren't connecting that this is an you know, imperialist problem. They're connecting it with a problem with socialism in conjunction with the continued red scare that's existing in Peru because of, you know, the civil war, that the left wing is not saying necessarily we're going to be like them, but that we're going to have our own thing going on. And kind of like in the style of the way Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is like, oh, well, we're going to have our own socialism, not like other socialism. Although they're not saying Scandinavia is anything important. <laughs> no, no one cares about Scandinavia. <laughs> There's no Peruvian Bernie Sanders talking about the Swedish uh, yeah, well, the know, welfare. Yeah, we're not really, not really doing that. 